It's gonna be cool when there's guests and then we can just put all the attention on them. Yeah, right? Take a step back. I know, I feel weird being on camera. No. It's weird for me to be on camera. Is it? Yeah, it's always weird. I feel the same level of like, huh. like hesitation and potential insecurity that you do. Yeah. I'm just never, I get, I'm lucky because I just sit behind the camera. Well, I think the more about. we do, it, we'll, we'll get comfy. <laughs> So, exciting things happening at Brew, huh? Yes. You, um, you have a new watch coming out? The Alt- Titanium watch? Oh! oh. Alt- well, yeah, that too. Now, even more special is the Alton Brown watch. So, a long time ago. Yeah, that is kind of... Got to see the boxer for the first time. Oh, that's one that's of the boxes. Really one of the boxes. So, you have yeah. multiple boxes? Well, there's like multiple stages to opening the box. So, you have the watch, you have the box that would be the black inner box. Then you have the black outer box. You have the booklet, the cleaning cloth, of course the watch. And so it's like all these different levels. Oh yeah, the booklet is, um, I like the booklet. Well, yeah, you know what it is? Like a big part of the watch is, it's not just like the object itself. It's knowing how it came to be. Right. And let's just say this gets shipped around the world. I'm sure it's gonna be landing all around the world. We won't be there to hand this off physically and say, hey, this is kind of the origin, origin story for the watch. But we still want them to have the same experience and understanding as if I physically handed it to them. Right. Um, so, yeah, every watch has that story that goes with it. What, have, what, are, what were some unique challenges you faced when you were working on this watch with Alton? Well, challenges, yes, there, there's many. But I would say, like, the benefit I had was working with really good people like him Mm -hmm. he's very understanding about branding um the product who's going to receive it so he has this good understanding of he comes from a culinary expert level background where i come from a watch background and he approached this with me in, in such an organic way to say not only do we want to have something unique but how do we have something unique that plays to both of our idealistic backgrounds so you're about coffee espresso all right well let's curb that thought it's good and we'll archive that but he also comes from a culinary background so timing a shot of espresso is interesting um it pertains to the food industry in a way and so if we could have this idea we eventually came up with was this espresso-esque dial that would be the perfect collaboration between both people And it's not often when you have a collaboration where you can mix two highly different parties together and morph it into a product. Typically, collaborations are, ah, this is a color, a serial number, and then just through, you know, the chain of command. It's just another corporate product. But this was much more genuine and authentic to both people to come together. Yeah, so for people who don't know who Alden Brown is, he's... Basically, he's a celebrity chef. Is that accurate yeah, to say? At, at the very least, he, he is so much. But yeah, most people recognize him for uh, being a celebrity chef on television. Yeah, yeah his uh, show is Let's Let's Eat on the Food Network. So yeah, right? everything from Chopped, uh, Good Eats, Chopped, Good well, Eats, okay. the the Return. Uh, he has been on television. Oh, it's Good Eats. Yeah, Good Eats. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I say Let's Eat? I think you did. <laughs> Your mind is in the right place. I have the internet literally right here. <laughs> we watch him all the time. We do. We actually, there are times when we're working on videos late at night and we will order food and then put Alton Brown on my laptop and just watch an episode. It's nice to eat food and understand the technicalities. Exactly. While you're enjoying it. You yeah. want to watch other people make food while you eat food. There's it's something just natural. That, that just soothing about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's great. So... That is a really cool opportunity to be able to, to uh, collaborate with somebody like that. When it's big brands that are collaborating with a celebrity, I'm sure there's it's just all kinds of bureaucracy and let's meet in this boardroom and we'll go over this and then we'll send decisions through this channel and this person is going to come up with this, blah, blah, blah. And it's like a whole lot of hubble, hubble, hubble I don't know what the word is I'm trying to say. A lot of hubble. Hubble. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, a lot of bureaucratic uh, but, decision making. Right, but yeah. since you're, you know, you are Brew, you're the guy. What does it look like to interact with somebody like an Alton Brown? He was a very special, he is a very special individual in that 
the mission was very clear. We both wanted to make a, let's call it a legacy product that would live on forever and highlight both of us in yeah. the best way possible. But where, where would you go to make these decisions? Like, do, do you guys just call each other on the phone? Do you meet yeah. up somewhere? Both. So long phone calls of this is the idea and this is the mission that I have in mind. And, and so like we kind of will we'll talk and collaborate our ideas on the phone. But you got to meet in person. You got to show our, here's the best result that we have. And this isn't working so well. What should we be aiming for next? And so, yeah, we're, we're meeting over coffee. We're, we're meeting on the phone. Lots of, of emails of back and forth just to get all these nuances correct. What was it? Can you tell, tell me about the first time you met him? What was that like? Like in person? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I was so excited because I said, hey, there's a big watch show in town. You know, please come by. Um, fortunately he didn't come. And I say that because I feel as though going to a watch show with 15, 20,000 attendees could be overwhelming for anyone. Um, so I'm glad he didn't come because he would have gotten bulldozed by uh, a ton of fans. Um, instead he said, Hey, I'm going to be in town the next morning if you'd like to get coffee. And lo and behold, he arrives early on time, which I love. And he's online and he asked me, hey, what would you like? Uh, I'm at the coffee shop. So one, he's already on time, makes me happy. Uh, but two, he's very generous saying, i get you a coffee, what would you like? And I said, I'll have an espresso. And I think he replied something in the light of, of course you would. <laughs> and I remember arriving and, and seeing just this plain clothes man online. And I just give him a little pat and say, Halton, is that you? And he turns around, oh, friendly face, there he is. And Better than what I expected. Super friendly. You never know. Very friendly, as as he always was on the phone and what you see on television. And I remember when I tried to pay for the coffee, he he, he pushed me out so quickly. He, he fought me to the end. I said, no, no, I got this. You fight over paying for coffee quite a bit. Huh? Yeah, it's very hard to beat me on paying for coffee. <laughs> I won today. You won today. Yeah, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> and so shows up on time. Super kind, courteous, and generous to... You know, make the time, get me the coffee. And more than all of that, when I sat down again, first time physically face to face, he is an excellent listener. Um, he can, of course, share thoughts to the highest degree. Very experienced guy, seen and done it all. Um, did he come prepared with anything? First of all, where did you guys go? Like what, what yeah. coffee shop? I, I believe it was like Devotion. It was, I, I believe. In the city? Midtown. Yeah, yeah, it was like in the 20s. Okay. And cool little coffee shop. We kept it very private. We didn't want to get interrupted. Right. Uh, he's wearing one of his brew watches, which was Ooh. nice. What What? Um, was? He was wearing a blue dial metric watch on a leather strap. Okay. And again, somebody like him, he could be wearing any watch under the sun. He knows about every brand you could imagine. Wait, did you say a metric on a leather strap? Yeah, yeah. So Interesting. He, I don't he think I've swapped seen that. that metal bracelet for something more comfortable. Uh, and he wanted the leather. I said, yeah, wow. definitely. That's very cool. Yeah. I got to see that. I've never seen that. Yeah, I'll send you a photo. I've seen the other way where you have the bracelet on the retrograph. I, I personally like the metal bracelet on the metric because the lines of the tapered bracelet to the case are a little bit more fluid. Mm -hmm. Whereas although the strap is also tapered for me, it's a material disconnect. So going from leather to metal, although yeah, form, yes, material, there's a bit of a break. Mm. So I okay. always choose metal on metal. Yeah. I got that. Yeah. So, so you're meeting with him at this coffee shop. You're, he buys you an espresso. He's extremely, generous yeah and very comical because he knew exactly oh yeah john's gonna get in this <laughs> he's, he's nice to sit down with you know there's some people you go and you're counting the minutes yeah so you can get away and him you, the time flew by before i even knew i'm like oh, i've been here for quite a while but it was so enjoyable and that's how that was another confirmation i'm like i'm with good people right now yeah because it's it's like school when you work with a group project sometimes there's there's some people who are like, very challenging to work with yeah. But because he's experienced, he's not just some celebrity chef that only works in one channel. He's experienced on creative uh, motion pictures. He works with film. He understands cinematography. He understands oh, yeah. the structure and what it takes to bring a project to life. Yeah. 
So he's patient, he's understanding, and three and three, he's just a cool guy. Yeah, I remember when we did the promo video with him, uh, we were shooting in his apartment in the city. Yeah. He yeah. and his wife, um, who were very gracious enough to go and get us coffee. Elizabeth <laughs> got us coffee. Again, she's a very she's busy woman. Very nice, very appreciative. Still yeah. Very, very kind with her time. That yeah. Says a lot um, about who they are. And I remember he was like, we, I was setting up the shot uh, and both cameras and trying to figure out the lighting. And he just was like, running into the back of the room, grabbing other lights, like, oh, could you utilize this? Like, I have this, it's a kicker. Yeah. You know, maybe he even, like, it, when you watch the video, if you look in the background where he has, there's, like, this, um, I think it's, it's, like, a fake plant or something like that on a cart, like a drink cart. Okay. And you can see, like, this, there's this really nice, like, kicker light that's hitting it to give some texture to the background. He provided that kicker That was light? him, yeah. Uh. That was his idea. It was his idea. <laughs> So I can't take credit. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Credit to Alton on the yeah, light. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alton, for that. Cool. Um, yeah, so so very cool. I, I It's you a really that. interesting watch. Yeah. And, and I mean that in the most positive way. I, I really like the way it looks. The strap looks really cool as well. Um, it's it's very... We, we visited those guys. Billy Kirk. Billy Kirk. Yeah, all, all um, hand design, handmade. Yeah, they're... Their workshop is unbelievable. It looks, it looks like somebody ripped it out of the set of Yellowstone or something. There's so much ye- like leather and work workmanship. It's a complete vibe. Yeah, when you go in there. The, the the tools, the machines, but the hand tools, every stitch, all done by hand. It's yeah. incredible. It's and watching them work and I forget the gentleman's name. Jay, you got Jay. It. Jay? Was it Jay? Kirk and Chris. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We filmed them doing various things with the yeah, stitching and every and, stitch and trimming. Yeah. Every that what was that? What's that tool called? Uh, so there's like trimming and there's also burnishing just to clean up the edges. Right. Oh, yeah. that's what it was. And then there's yeah. scathing, I believe, where if the leather's too thick, you want to just trim down the thickness just a little bit, so when you fold it, the thickness isn't um, inhibiting any. Let's just say passover of a, a, a keeper or right. the watch to fit within the, the leather band oh yeah so so yeah i mean it's exciting to see how people react to it because i think they're gonna love it yeah and this all came about in an organic way Alton, oh, yeah. he loved brew watches and he just posed the question one day would you be interested in this yeah of course a huge smile yes how can we do it and and he didn't take it lightly to just say, let's make another watch just because. He looked at this as a, if we're going to do this, it needs to be the greatest, most unique thing that exists. Yeah. He really challenged it. Challenged oh, yeah. us. Well, it was a cool idea. The I, I love the idea of like, it's already a limited run of watches, but you're, ta- you're giving more exclusivity, exclusivity to it in the sense that each dial has its own unique pattern to it. Yeah. Like no watch is going to be the same. Every single one is different. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah. Highly uncommon. Unless you're talking about bespoke, horological, very, very expensive watches where, you know, the price reflects within the materials, what reflects in the quality. We didn't look at this as so much of a price inhibitive design. We just said, how can we make the most unique watch for every person we weren't thinking just the watch lives on its own we said how does every person have something exclusive Mm -hmm. never see again they could be on the other side of the world but they feel connected to the brands the person through this one exclusive i say exclusive but really just a highly unique one-of-a-kind piece that that lives on its own like that is the owner's you know that owner completes this watch in a way and then that's a connection to Alton or that's a connection to Brew. Um, there's so many things happening through one single watch. Yeah. And we didn't make a ton. So it's like for the people that have it, we assume and really anticipate they'll appreciate it for the long run. I mean, Brew's doing some really incredible things. Well, you're doing some really incredible things All for good Brew. people. Um, Speaking of, you just became the Red Bull of watches. Oh, yeah. Sent, yeah. <laughs> sent a, 
sent a uh, metric retro dial into space. Yeah. And first ever espresso shot yeah. poured timed in space. That's what what like how did you come up with the idea for that? First so, of all, I think what's happening more common these days is I'm more comfortable in the skin of brew in, in, in that I do what I enjoy, but I don't forget the roots of brew. So brew, it's about enjoying your time over coffee. It's about good people. Um, it's about timing a shot, yes, but it's the mantras. It's through and through with coffee, uh, but in the most classical sense, in a refined sense. Um, naturally, I love cars. I say naturally because I was brought up with it, and a lot of people also can connect in this way. Cars, space, anything automotive, it's these machines that's exciting, just like a watch. And it was through the research of, of space, it, which I constantly do, I, I found these engineers that send products into space, usually for large, big companies, big budgets, you know, big ideas. And I said, you know, although I'm still categorized as a micro brand, I said, let me still reach out. I was like, shoot your shot, see what happens. Worst case scenario, you just got a hello from these incredible engineers and, and just kind of hear what they say. And so I reached out again, just through researching space. I wasn't even looking at watches. So what, what kind of, when working with this company where, I mean, obviously that's a very unique one-off mechanism to create. So were there some specific challenges that maybe, cause you're not building the machine, they're building the machine. Right. What kind of things were they running into? when trying to get this to come to fruition. Yeah, whenever you have a project like this, the first question is always budget and what do you have as an expectation? When they ask me about budget, I just, big question mark, I was like, I don't know, it's the first time I've ever dealt with this. Um, what can we complete together? And we said, oh, well, we could send a watch into space and you could have beautiful imagery, um, but we can do just about anything you can imagine. So challenge us, but also, Let's have it make sense for your brand. And so I slept on it and said, okay, let's revisit this. And I was like, oh, what's the most wild thing? I removed budget. I removed any like preconceived notions of what other people have done. I said, all right, well, espresso machines, coffee. It's like, that's the true roots of brew. So can we send an espresso machine to space? And just for fun, this is like a wild idea, I know. And their, their faces were just absolutely blank. I said, oh, well, that, that's the end of it. I said, let us get back to you on this. And through a few conversations, I said, absolutely, it's possible. Of course, it's a bigger budget, but if you'd like, we're confident that we can send an espresso machine into space with your watch. And, and this is all gonna, gonna happen as you can imagine. Were they running into any kind of like, or maybe they just didn't tell you, but were there any kind of uh, things that they were trying to overcome? I know weather was a big thing. Oh, yeah. there's a lot like, of obstacles. Yeah, like, because you started this when? in February of last year. February of last year. So it's like a, a year, a year and a month. Over, yeah, because they, I mean, they're in the UK, right? Yes. So they're constantly having to deal with the weather weather patterns. And since it's a balloon, I'm, there has to be something with how you need, like, a complete clear sky. Yeah. With, or for FAA perfect reasons, winds. you need to be able to, to spot your balloon. Also, uh, radar, you need to be able to have good, uh, how do you say, you need to have good reception on uh, whatever you're sending out there so you can mm. track it. Because you can't just send an object at that altitude and just let it go. Yeah. You have to send and track it and make sure everything is in, within your guidelines. Yeah. Last thing you need is a headline that's like, Espresso machine gets lost. <laughs> Brew metric takes down 747. <laughs> oh, God, no, 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 no. So, so they, they chose the perfect space. They got the permits for it, and it was all just mapped out. So they had the arc That's cool. all planned. Yeah. And, yeah, weather would have definitely been an issue. And it was. I think in, and the other cool thing was, I think I remember you saying that, like, one of the things they had to overcome was how the espresso itself because of the temperatures what was that so if you're making espresso any liquid at that altitude you're a hundred thousand feet above the earth's surface it's sub-zero temperatures everything would just turn into frost so there's a few things you had to look at fluid dynamics so you had to look at what rate the fluid would be coming through 
you also had to look at the viscosity. If it's too mm. heavy, too dense, then it might just hit and splash. If it's too light, it might just blow into the air. Interesting. Um, but number one is it could turn into frost. So we had to create a mixture of alcohol to espresso content. We espresso. Mm. We, we essentially made a espresso martini. Yeah. And through Irish this coffee. Irish coffee. First Irish coffee in space. Ever in space. <laughs> but that concoction was necessary. Otherwise, it would have just been a frozen slushy and never would have even touched the cup. Oh, wow. How do you test for something like that? Is that all theoretical? Or do you like somehow recreate the conditions on on Earth? That's a good <laughs> on question. the ground. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, they did multiple tests on the ground, but there's nothing like well, obviously, gravity changes, temperature changes, uh, winds, velocities, all these things. You can only theoretically test on Earth. Um, we did four to six tests of actually sending it up. Mm. which is time, money, planning, and obviously how many espresso machines are you going to destroy sending right. it out? Oh, that's a good point. It's like crash testing a car. It's expensive. Wow. Yeah. So there's four uh, world record espresso machines <laughs> out there. There was a lot of tests. Maybe but, you could get one. Well, Did we got the original lock. Frame it, put yeah. it in the office. Oh, we're gonna, yeah, yeah. So we have to collect the watch and machines from them still. Oh, that's so cool. Um, but there's been one watch that's done this mission many times. Oh, really? It's the same watch every same time? Same watch. Oh, okay. So I got that. Yeah, that's a cool case back. Oh, yeah, the it, one of one etched on yeah. the back. Do you so think no. you'd ever, like, do, like, a civilian version of that where you're for sale, like? Uh, well, this one, I definitely want to auction off for charity. So that will have its own oh, lifespan, cool. which is cool. Um, but like a civilian version, maybe, maybe now that we know it's possible. Yeah. But I also don't want to steal the thunder of this project. Galactic so. themed brew watch. Maybe. <laughs> kind of cool. Well, congrats on, on finally Thanks. getting it up there and coming back down. Cause I think like the coolest part for me was first of all, seeing it obviously. Yeah. Um, but also was the film aspect of it like included in everything or is that extra uh so no that that's a huge part of not to make this an production. advertisement for them but oh no, it's a huge part of the production because you know sending up is one part of the project but the other half is making sure they have the right camera rigs which means building this entire system what's called a vehicle yeah this carbon fiber vehicle that holds multiple cameras holds your object in this case an espresso machine a watch but even Further is, okay, well, now this espresso machine has to be activated in space. The watch has to be activated with a, uh, an activator um, actuator. And so that's kind of part of the production as much as it is building the rig to hold it all. Yeah. In these big, heavy cameras. So, you know, you're looking at this from an engineering standpoint of, yes, A to B and, and returning. But just receiving that footage, you have to build your entire project to to hold it. Yeah. I think they only use GoPros for that, though. Uh, I, or did they use something else? I think they might do have. Do GoPros them. not last in space? No, GoPros could definitely. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, I think they may have used other cameras. Okay. I'm not sure if it was red cameras, which would be cool, but too heavy, I believe. I, well, looking at the footage, I can tell you they did not put red cameras. On okay, the so that's confirmed. No, that would camera. also be really scary for them to do. Forty thousand dollars a head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lost. They'll definitely track that. Yes, yeah, the hundred thousand dollar red camera plus cinema lenses. Yeah, too much be, to lose. Yeah. They definitely had those on the ground though. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's that was a cool for me, like because I didn't shoot any of that B roll. I only shot that one tiny part where you're like um I forget what your line was uh <laughs> speaking about this is the first ever uh oh no you're like um something up in space literally like that's oh, that yes. part the talking head part yeah yeah um but i was so impressed with the footage that they sent over the guy did such whoever shot it i don't know if it was one guy or multiple guys but it did such an awesome job i told they you labeled every single clip like that as an editor it's a dream come true <laughs> when i saw the final video after you had sent it to me i literally got chills well it's and, a, a they're like 50 percent of that you know like they did such an awesome job with filming and yeah they made it so like 
documentary so it was great yeah we had good people on this oh yeah yeah so it was a long time coming but worth it together, really yeah oh it's yeah. not many times where we could work on a project for over a year and say it was worth it oh yeah absolutely yeah. so i ran into troy okay the other night troy barmore he's a good people good people over at revolution magazines yep <clears throat> and he 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 had a question okay for you <laughs> um and it's this why don't you charge more for your watches? Uh, it's a great question. There's a really good significant answer to this. Okay. Lots of people, although a lot of new people will say, ah, they're always looking for a better rate. The people that know and follow always say, why don't you charge more? And the real answer is when I started through watches almost 10 years ago, I had a set amount, which was what I was able to purchase for a watch. And it was always so difficult for me to go and find something special. Of course, you know, you wanted to have something not often go and buy a watch. It's not like just a simple pair of shoes, even shoes. But um, I knew how gratifying it is to have something attainable. And by having that, it, it kind of brings you into this ecosystem. So it's not like it's one and done. Once you are able to get that, you're able to enjoy what it's like to be a part of this brand, this community. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a really long road. But that barrier for me 10 years ago, it was so disappointing. I knew if and when I ever had the opportunity to create a product mm -hmm. that would go to market, I was kind of the key holder to say, you have access to this attainable product or I'm going to price you out and build this very expensive product that is unattainable. Yes, people can afford it, but many people can't. And I know what that disappointment's like. Mm. The other part of this was, well, Jonathan, if you have such an awesome product that people want to try on, a lot of these people have never seen your watch before. They've never handled it because people from around the world. The main mission is to just essentially give people a taste of the quality, the design, and, and the ethos of the brand. So as long as it's somewhat attainable, it does both parties a service. They get to try it and own it. And so, of course, they're, as long as everything goes well, they'll be very happy with this and they'll be a client for life. On my end, now I'm building a community. So the more people that are part of this, the, the stronger it is, not just for me, but for everybody that's that knows about it, that shares their experiences. It's like kind of creating a whole, the idea of a brand for me was much different than for others. It wasn't just a simple organized business category of brand equals this look. For me, brand was community, access, sharing stories, and just leveling up so many more, uh, I would say, people beyond the product mm. and that all stems to price now if i outpriced all these people then i feel like there wouldn't be that many people that would be able to share their stories to have these significant layers and you know i won't always be here forever so as long as these people kind of own the watches share their experiences that is kind of timeless it's forever and legacy yeah, that's that's the legacy. That's the brand. It's interesting because I, I, it's a, it's like it's almost like you have this strike of balance with that because if you're putting a barrier to entry to people in terms of price, then you're not going to have a lot of people who are champions of the brand. But if you have the price too low, or you make it way too accessible, then it just cheapens the brand, and then you might have a bunch of people who are in this community, but it's not as meaningful to them. Yeah. So you, I think you hit such a perfect, this is kind of what I was, this was my answer essentially to Troy. It was like that the community aspect of it is so much more important than wherever, than what the actual price of the watch is. Yeah. Because you want people to feel special for owning a brew. Yeah. We also don't want to exclude people or cheapen what the value of having a brew is. No. And I'll tell you what people pay for the watch will never equal the treatment, the community, all the things that go with 
you know, the after sales, the, all the experiences, it's never going to be your time, right? It's never going to equal your time and the commitment and the effort. Um, but that's why they say, love what you do. You got to be passionate about it because, and this is something I learned early. You got to always give more than 50%. You got to give more than what you receive. It'll pay dividends, whatever that is. For me, it's joy mm -hmm. and, and sharing. But you're never going to receive the, the priceless amount of value that you put into the product, the people and the experiences. That oh, is yeah. just, you can't expect that. No, never. I mean, that's a completely subjective thing. Like when you're attached to a project, no matter what it is, if it's a video or creating a watch, like it's so much more meaningful to you as an individual. So yeah. it's, it's impossible. You're, you're yeah. set. But like, that's not to say that that's a bad thing. It's no, just, no. you definitely get such a huge reward from eventually putting it out there and seeing how people respond to it. And there's other parts to it as well. Like Troy, he and I are like, we're in the watch enthusiast, let's call it a bubble. So like we measure things in specs and time and, and kind of relative to the market. So like we're very granular, but then there's the other portion of the market, which is your everyday person that just walks into a store shopping online. Yes, they look apples to apples, but at the end of the day, budget is only so far. Mm -hmm. And so you do have to measure, well, bottom line is like, what is your product living like for value? But what does that equal to the enthusiast? That might be much more. And what does that look like in value to the everyday person with a normal budget? I say normal because not everybody has excessive funds and if they do, it doesn't mean that they necessarily put it towards watches. Right. It's interesting. Do you find there's um, so something I, I so I'm a car guy. Um, oftentimes, I can I try to find metrics to determine if somebody's a car person for the experience and the love of cars versus utilizing cars as as a status symbol so it's a very weird thing to because you have to kind of judge the person's character in a certain way or look at their behavior or what they kind of put forth out into the world to determine that i'm wondering if there's any way that you think you can determine what kind of behaviors do you see watch owners exhibiting that differentiate between them being a true like Watch enthusiasts, like a $100 watch is as meaningful to them and exciting to them as like a $4,000 watch. Right. That's like a true watch enthusiast, like they still, right? Versus somebody who's just trying to show off the, the flex, the roll flex. Yeah. You know, it's interesting with brew watch owners, I think it's the complete opposite of the flex. So you have the people that buy the Audemars, uh, the Rolexes that are six figures, way plus. And then you have brew wash owners and the people with the APs, not always, not speaking to the, the masses, but a lot of times these folks might be buying it for a status symbol. Sure, they bought it as a milestone for recognition in, in some format. And they want to share that. It's like letting people know I've, I've made it to this point in my life of success. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed with brew owners, as much as they do buy it for milestones, it's very personal. So it's like a lot of times, Brew owners, if you know, you know, but a lot of times it's just the person that purchased this that knows the brand, that knows the significance, the value, you name it, and the story. So it's much different from the Audemars Rolex customer where it's more of a flex for the outside. This is such a selfish, rewarding product that makes people remember their own significant times. Interesting. And it's interesting to see that crossover now I say community multiple times, this person just reached their milestone, whether they got married, job, you mentioned at school, they share that online. They see, oh, well, I just saw John Smith also get married. And you see these stories cross over. I see it through comments and messages. And my favorite thing is when I could take a back seat, see them collaborate with their messaging. And I know I kind of facilitated that indirectly. And so I, that, that's the difference, right? outright I, I guess uh so what you're saying is if somebody who's wearing a patek then sees a brew and goes oh that's a nice brew 
they're probably a watch enthusiast. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, and not to you know say it lightly. It's not like if you have a brew watch, it's just because you can only afford attainable watches. No, of course not. We have multi-millionaire billionaires that will buy brew watches. Yeah, and it's it's not filling a void as much as. It strikes a certain chord from them. It's for the love of, of watches. It's like it's somebody who watches, yeah. has like three Ferraris, but one of their favorite cars is their spec Miata. It could be, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Not to say bruise a spec Miata, but... But to that point, <laughs> the, the, there's something that those brands are not delivering, whether yeah. it's the ethos, the design, how it feels, how it wears. Unique experience. It's different, yeah. Yeah. Maybe not a spec Miata, maybe a... Uh, um. An M4. All right. I'll take yeah. it to M4. <laughs> BMW M4. That's yeah. true. It's, the community is such is so strong, and like that's really such an important part of brew as a whole. Um, I would like to move on to some more character, personal related questions. Hit me with it. Cool. All right. So, I, actually, what, the first thing I want to give you, this is like related to how you interact with people and it's um it's a hypothetical all right imagine two different people you're planning on spending some time with one is someone you really want to impress and keep around stay in your life the other one's someone you want to get rid of but maybe you know you don't want to just tell them get out of here you want to turn them off in a sense um you have to take each of them to a destination or destinations of your choice to achieve each goal where do you bring them what's your itinerary and why mm, good question well if it's somebody that i don't want to see again i probably would not bring them to the place i go most often just because i wouldn't want to cross paths with them again but i'll tell you one thing i would do and this is to my personality as you, you mentioned this is crazy. Call me nuts, but I would treat both people identical in terms of the conversation, listening and the back and forth balance. And the reason why is more times than not, I've been surprised in my life where I think I know the outcome, the expectation of what this person will be like, what their mission is, right? Everybody's got a mission and kind of like, is this person going to be frustrated? Are they trying to sell me something like, do I really want to get out of here? But what I've learned over these past, let's let's call it the past decade of, of my personal and professional life is people have surprised me more times than not. So even though I think to myself, and, and many times I go to these meetings and I am, I'm calculating how fast I can get out of there. How, how fast can I deliver the results that they want to hear? All right, mm -hmm. you want to sell me something? Okay, have at it. So I'll listen to the pitch. I'll give them but I still give them the time of day and, and, and like this little bit of a, a cushion. Whereas when I first started, no, I guess this is kind of how I always was. I give people the time because um, they surprise me. And I would feel more regret if I dismissed them. And I still have friends and close partners that would say like, John, you're going to see person X. Why? You already know it's a waste of time. Mm. Um, but you know, I, I don't like to dismiss people because you know, they, there's a couple ways to look at it. You want, you want to learn about somebody, look at their history. Yes. People don't change dramatically, but I think people given the right circumstances really try, uh, for the best results. So mm. I, I've been surprised. So quick answer, long winded, actually, I give both conversations the same amount of attention and balance, whether okay. listening and engaging. Location, if it's somebody I might not want to see again, I'm not gonna go to my favorite cafe, probably. Mm -hmm. I might take them to a new spot. So even if it's not the ah. best conversation, at least I had a good time yeah. with the environment, the staff, you name it. Now, if it's somebody that's like my best person, I love them, I love seeing them, then I might take them to like more of an intimate location, whether it's a cafe, a bar, um, someplace if specific. A specific place would be like Lock Loam, NoHo, right? So like 400 Lafayette Street. I know the address. <laughs> cool spot. And I take them there knowing that I'm going to be running through here again. If they take another acquaintance here or if I bump into them, like it'll be a, it'll be a good thing. You know, I want to round up people that I like 
coming here because worst case scenario i bump into them or their friends and it's like that's a good thing yeah you know i think it's great that you want to treat both parties equally i'm that's... not just saying that because i'm on camera it's no i know it's the truth. i i yes you you definitely live that life I, you're i'm surprised though that you wouldn't take me like mcdonald's or something Ah, no. Should you you just start taking the meetings you don't want to take at McDonald's? No, 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 no. You gotta... I think you you get what you give, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And this is kind of what I said earlier. It's like you give more with no expectations, and it pays dividends. Just meaning at least you gave your very best. So the results, if you're not happy with them, it's not your fault. It's just the result of the situation Mm -hmm. or maybe the other party. But yeah. you can never say at least you didn't give your all and then excess. Yeah. So you're really, you're investing your best self in every equation if you want to calculate it that way. Yeah, I know. I, re, that resonates with me a lot, actually. I, I always, a lot of times I feel like I get frustrated when somebody doesn't want to meet me halfway for something. Because like, even if you know it's not going to work out, whether it's like business or like dating or whatever. I'd rather be able to give it my best shot and say that I tried versus just assuming that things are just not going to flesh out in any way whatsoever. It's better to be able to tell yourself like, yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't a good fit. You can sense when somebody doesn't give at least 50%. Yeah. It's I, for me, that's frustrating. It is, you know? Yeah. So yeah. you know what? I'm compl- don't, definitely don't take it to McDonald's. People I'm, are very I'm intuitive. Wrong. You can, you can feel it. <laughs> yeah. That's very true. Okay. Um, okay, I want to show you, get your reaction okay. to, uh, this is crazy. Uh, I just found this on Reddit. Okay. It is a, well, I'll just let you read this. Okay. So I'll give this to you. Thank you. You can just scroll through the pictures there. Scroll through the pictures. Yeah. So what's it's a read the title out. Okay. Uh, so it says Russian McDonald's watch. Any thoughts? Picked up this guy for $265. And I'm looking at a wooden watch box, it looks like. So, next image. Oh, cool. It's a little McDonald's watch. It says 1990 Moscow. Where do you think... Do you think... um, Oh. Is that like one of those partnership kinds of things? Or is that McDonald's themselves made a watch? Um. Well, if there's any McDonald's or insignia of a brand like this, just for trademark copyright issues, they would typically have to go through McDonald's to get this accepted through their license or. But it's Russia. It's okay. It, would, it also depends on the year. Russia still has to play by the rules. It doesn't mean... Um, uh, so, like, a huge company like McDonald's still is going to deal with them in a, in a corporate format. Mm-hmm. So I'm more than positive mcdonald's sues russia for no. <laughs> let's see made in hong kong yeah these are these are cool and you know what i actually i do like this because this was probably given to an employee that's been there for many years whether it's a manager or one of their employees that did a, a great job over the years you know what it could be and i remember back when i worked at porsche we there was we used to laugh at these guys all the time because the franchise owners would often get some kind of reward, uh, or they would be so they would be so integrated into the brand of McDonald's that they would get like McDonald's branded things. Mm. And I remember that back then there was uh, I I don't remember where I found the images. I don't know if I'll be able to find them to put them up on the screen right now, but they, there was like these guys who would take like nine eleven turbos, Panameras, and deck them out in like McDonald's red and yellow, and they looked horrific. Yeah, imagine like, that looking good. <laughs> Two tone yellow and red seats, like bright red, bright yellow. Why are they doing this? Because McDonald's. That's how they made their money. Okay. And so they would like display these cars. They're proud. It's wild. That's a crazy color car. Yeah. But man, when they look living, like toy cars. Yeah. But there's something to be said about that. When you're at a company for however long or whatever you do, like 
if McDonald's was the place that you made it, yeah, you'll deck it out. So maybe that's like what's going on here. Maybe they found a a watch manufacturer that would do like a custom design like this. Yeah. So they don't do this as they used to. They'll have these days the most common thing is sports teams. So let's just say whether it's like Rutgers football or if you are like San Francisco, whatever football team, Yankees, they'll have sports team watches. They just put the the logo on it. It's a generic watch. Mm-hmm. But the old days, the old days, 70s, 80s, early 90s, they would have these special insignia watches. This is cool because it had a little buckle even with the McDonald's molded uh, steel insignia. That's very cool. Yeah. They don't do that like they used to for employees. Like, you could look. They would have the Domino's dial watch for Rolex. They would have uh, the Comex. They would have the Exxon. Whatever corporate um, business that they had, they would really reward their employees. These days, I don't see it as a common practice. It's kind of stopped at school rings, baseball, football, sports teams, insignias, and and you don't have that same amount of precious attitude towards employees, which, you know, it's kind of nice to see how they would reward their employees back in the day. Yeah, I mean, that is, I mean, you have like a embroidery on the strap. You have like this, like you were saying, this custom metal piece, which it looks like it's the arches. I'm not sure what the little... And that was custom designed, yeah, custom made, and installed. That's that's not off the shelf. This also looks kind of retro. Like, would you? I would say that's from like early nineties. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not like custom, that. custom. You could tell that case is probably like a a generic case. But oh, what they did I'm was confused. Why the wooden box? So they probably didn't work with like a big watch house. It says made in Hong Kong. They probably used generic packaging that was able to be laser engraved custom to the customer needs. So it feels high value, but it's customizable so they can use it across all different customers. Okay. Hmm. All right. Well, enough about McDonald's cause I'm getting hungry, <laughs> but, um, all right. So we're, we're almost out of time here, but oh, I have no. some, uh, I'm having such a good time. I know me too. I have some, some kind of maybe not rapid fire questions, but, Got a few questions here. Okay. Fun ones. Um, so the first one is, uh, if you could travel back in time to witness any historical event in person, which would it be and why? Historical in my, in my own personal life? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I guess. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, no, not your person. It, oh, it, well, you could. World, you could world. give me both. It'd be weird to <laughs> witness yourself. Well, I was like, yeah, what's the best time of my life? I'm, I'm going to, I like it to be tomorrow. Um, so yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of bad historical events. Um, well, that's what's taught to us, so we don't repeat <laughs> it, of course. So that's, that's what's ingrained. Don't say the Hindenburg. Um, no, no, no. Uh, let's see. Well, you know what it is, uh, if you want to take this. How about, how about like a time period? Like general time period. Maybe not an event. Yeah. General, like a, what's a time period? It's crazy because I think of like world history. And so there's yeah. like um, the good old days, at least the way it was projected to us as we grew up, were like anywhere from the 50s to the 70s. And I say the good old days because everybody had this certain amount of you go to your job, you make enough money, it goes very far. You could buy your nice car, you come back to your family. It was like a predictable lifestyle. Right. And so it's, I say 50 to 70s because after that, you know, things, mm-hmm. you know, they change. History is cyclical. Things keep changing. Um, but something about that was nice where you could work a normal job with normal $3,000 car, $40,000 house. You could predict, yeah, what you would have and where you would go. Mm-hmm. You had predictable vacations per year, predictable family values. The neighborhood was also predictable. Um, yeah, there, there was something there that that's nice. People's people just treated their personal health like shit, though. Well, they didn't know. <laughs> yeah, smoking cigarettes, you smoking know, cigarettes, was, was normal. Drinking. You know, and now if you seventies, you you that's on you. Fun stuff. Yeah, coke. <laughs> you know, yeah, forget it. 
Okay. W- between the three decades, 50s, 60s, 70s, which would you most like to be in if you had to choose one? Probably 70s for the the free going style of, of people. 50s, I would imagine, is more buttoned up. 70s, I would say, is a little bit more free going. Not hippie like, although a, that's a thing. That's 60s. 60s. Yeah. But I would say 70s is still free going. Um, cars are still very cool. Yeah. Cars are like really cool. Late oh, yeah. 60s, early 70s. That's when cars are like, you're getting those beautiful body shapes yeah, and fast forms. Backs. Yeah, fastback Mustangs. Late 60s Ferraris are gorgeous. Now unattainable. Porsche. You name every major car brand, they're gorgeous in that time oh, yeah. period. And they're attainable. Dirt cheap. And then you, if I knew back then, then I would load up on all the cars, oh, yeah. store them, <laughs> And then, you know, you'd have like, yeah, car design and engineering, I feel like went steady increase from 50s to 60s to 70s. And then the 80s hit and then it just changed. You had yeah. there. Well, of course, there were good cars from the 80s, but none of them American. Almost none of them. No. 80s. Uh, it was like 82. I think they had the Corvette Stingray it had some beautiful body lines to it. Is that is the Corvette Stingray is it kind of the boxy one? No, no, no. Um, the back was a little angular, but the front half had like these real big swoops over the front wheel wells. Looking it up. It's like the original Stingray. It was like oh, okay, eighty yeah. to eighty-two was like the main years on that. It, it was. It's kind of like it's very similar to the um, the seventies one. Yeah, just but not all cars were nice. I mean, yeah. was it the Fox body Mustang was? relevant no that was fox body mustang late was not, 80s? i think it was ni- late 80s early 90s okay that was a that's a beloved enthusiast collector they still like that oh yeah people love the fox body i think it's ugly as shit but <laughs> people love it it used to be cool when we were young and it's got a five liter v8 yeah yeah it's people a big used motor. to they still feel pretty big at the the motorsports parks with that car but they're the thing that they hated was the mustang and it it was Locked like the early 90s. Too. It looked like a Batmobile. It Mustang. was only cool in the Cobra. The Cobra was the cool... King Cobra? No. Mm, think... No. Was it the King Cobra? Yeah, it's the King Cobra. Look at this thing. Oh, God. No, no, no. Is that, is that real? That's real. Oh, no. That's a real car. <laughs> uh, that's a mistake. Are you sure? Yeah. Mustang like, King look, Cobra. It looks like a Pontiac. It's might as well be. Uh, that's terrible. It's disgusting. Yeah, we all make mistakes. That's okay. <sighs> Do you have a do you have a car design that you're just absolutely like oh this ain't it? Oh, car design that I don't like. Yeah. Oh, there's plenty. Yeah. You know how hard it is to go. With... Any new ones? If I have infinite money and I have to go shopping, yeah, there's some good classics, but like, the majority of cars are not good looking, especially more modern cars. Yeah, safety safety regulations and everything has, you know, made everything kind of balloon. Yeah. At least that's what I have heard. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, cars I don't like many cars i do like so here's an issue give me question. some let's burn some bridges well you know as time goes on like your taste changes right like you don't like coffee that's when true. you're 12 years old but for some reason you love coffee when you're in your 20s yeah i like roasted brussels sprouts now do you really yeah they're good yeah have yeah, a little no, drizzle yeah. of like balsamic on there mm-hmm. you're you're in good order delicious but your taste changes as you get older so now i find my tasting cars is getting a little bit more i'm gonna say refined but that's a personal compliment I'm looking at older cars that are like completely unattainable. I'm looking at old Le Mans cars, like these prototype cars, late 60s Ferraris. I love it. And there's like one page that pops up and it's like Sotheby's auction because it's like one of six. Mm. And they're so unattainable that actually makes me gravitate towards it more. And so the cars I shop for are not only unattainable, I'm like, all right, well, what is similar to this? My searches are, what is similar to like this um porsche 906 career gts it's like there's nothing like it and and for good reason or i look at these le mans cars i'm like all right this isn't even street legal but i love it i love the lines of it and then you ask yourself and say why aren't more cars designed in this fashion because it's not not efficient it's not cost effective to manufacture yeah i think it's great but i'm the very sliver percentage that thinks this way it's funny because you, you know, there's like a meme on the internet in, in like the car community, like uh, 
building uh, my four hundred thousand dollar Porsche while working my minimum wage job or something like that, and you're kind of doing the same thing. Yeah, but with like ten million dollar Ferrari, yeah. like one of one Ferraris. It's incredible. Yeah, and then um, at the end of this, I'm like, I don't. I close the laptop. I'm like, I don't need this. Yeah. But every day I still revisit, you know? Never changes. No. Same thing you were doing when you were, you know, making $20,000 a year. You're doing when you're making significantly more. Yeah, but back then you looked at things that are attainable now. And so you just keep getting to that point where it does become attainable. Yeah. But then your your thoughts change and then you're refined to that level of your life. It's so called the hedonic treadmill. Is that what it's? Yes. You should put notes on that. That's interesting. It's when... Uh, it's it's when your your life improves, but then your your desires and wants meet this kind of threshold. So it's almost like you always think like, oh well, if all my money is up here, I'm gonna still be the same person down here. But then slowly you're like, well, I got a little bit more money, and maybe I'll spend some money on a it's nice dangerous apartment, a BMW. That's why new money <laughs> never lasts. That's like yeah, exactly. Old money, great. Yeah, new money. That's why everybody loses in that game. Hundred percent. That's a yeah. It's a weird concept, but it's like this hedonic treadmill is like you'll never be happy because you're always desiring something. I'll just say the grass is always greener. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So like, never get that Porsche 908 GTS because you will be there. You'll have nowhere to go. Yeah, yeah. nowhere to go from there. Or once I scratch that itch, I'll probably be satisfied for that week, and then I'll say, okay, well, then what's next? Yeah. Then you just start buying King Cobra Mustangs. You know what? <laughs> is Jay Leno's garage like a place that you can visit publicly or is it? All? I don't think so. See, I think we all need just a good walk around a, a beautiful car garage. Get that out of our systems and then go back to reality. Yeah. What well, we could aim to get him on the podcast sometime. Jay Leno? Yeah. Yeah. Or Jerry Seinfeld. He probably would. <laughs> he would. He's a local guy. He's on the East Coast at least. Yeah, but he's very... Yeah, maybe. Yeah. He's a little temperamental, but... I'd make him a brew fan. He should. Yeah. Cars and coffee. Come you on. Do like a brew watch with like a microphone as the... Yeah. Second <laughs> microphone. I don't know. Oh, I thought you were saying physical like microphone. So I Oh, no, no, no. Not some good to talk up, into. Like a stand-up microphone. Ah. Yeah, yeah, It's like just in case he has a good stand-up bit and just take a note. Yeah. Remember to. <laughs> <laughs> Why is coffee always so hot? <laughs> if you could master any skill or hobby overnight, what would it be and why? Okay. Mastering skills overnight. You know, it's kind of like what Elon's doing. Finding the most efficient way to engineer and produce products. So you know how he's got the Gigafactory? And he's mm -hmm. essentially, to sum it up, trying to stamp out whole parts to make his vehicles stronger but more efficient to make so it's not all these separate pieces and bodies that have to go together more mm. labor more time excess forget it so i'm like i wonder that skill applied to all products if you had that what would it look like so you could just walk into the aerospace scene you could walk to the automotive scene imagine for watches if you had that giga factory philosophy applied to watches I'm not saying you would make the Apple Watch, probably the complete opposite. What would that look like? So I would take the most efficient way to produce and manufacture items and then have that approach towards all products. It's probably just some technology that doesn't exist yet. It's like 3D printing, but what, was it, what would that be called? Additive like, manufacturing? Additive manufacturing? Yeah, that's What's like that? um, lasers that build up metal or, or oh. composites in, in certain yeah. aspects and they just build up the 3d products from there can it do like circuitry and things um, like that no imagine that or something so uh, you'd have to have a laser so precise to create like a can you imagine creating like an automatic watch that would be incredible do you think that would drive down the value of watches yeah i think there's something so okay that's a good question would that drive down the value? I think there's something inherently beautiful about humans that make the watches, everything from, yeah, the raw material, finishing, polishing, assembly, you know, you name it. Knowing that it was all hand assembled, for better or worse, that even when it fails, it's nice to know it was done by a human. Right. The more robotic or more 
cold that process gets. AI-ified. Exactly. <laughs> I think not only would it turn down price, <clears throat> maybe, but I think that would turn down the uh, desire, the, the intrigue oh, yeah. of the craft. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, look at, I was talking about like an old 60s Ferrari or Porsche versus a Tesla of today. Like, I give anyone that choice. Yeah. And it's way more, tri- make, make way that. more Teslas. Even though, like, from, they, I mean, they are rolling Apple watches essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Tesla. Like, it's great in terms of function. It does what it's, does exceptionally well at what it's built to do. But, you know, you're not hearing the crackles, pops, and bangs of like, your sport exhaust yeah. you're not like you know hearing that beautiful symphony of revs as you're going through like corners and yeah I'm imagine that's the same thing with with a watch that's just kind of like mass manufactured it just seems sterile yeah. yeah even if it's for the greater good whatever that philosophy is or whatever that result is it still feels sterile yeah you feel that when you think about places you've visited is there a location that feels like a hidden gem you'd love to return to and what makes it special to you? I feel like you have a lot of these. Yeah, I mean, every place is special in its own way. Uh, to, to Let's choose. say outside the US. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually where my, my mind shot out. Okay. It's different for any reason. I, I need context. Um, what was a special one for me was Iceland. That was a good one. Ooh. And I went at what time period most people would say is the worst so it's during the winter time i Mm. think it was december and why you don't want to go is because when the winter storm or or snow is blowing through you get these complete whiteouts where you can only see a few feet in front of your car so it's dangerous not only for visibility but the roads are icy and snowy sometimes you're so deep out on these these roads that if you get a whiteout you might not see that the road or the track of how you got in so that's kind of scary. And I had one instance, I'll talk about the scary and I'll talk about why it's beautiful. Okay. Um, where I drove to a little off, you know, off the road on, uh, what we'll call it like a, a viewpoint. Okay. And I couldn't see the road at all. So I, I stopped, got out of the car. Uh, what a car. I had a, a Jeep. You, four during wheel the winter, drive. You, yeah. need, you need a four okay. drive. And I got out and I took a few steps forward and I looked right where I stopped was a cliff that went straight down. What? I had no idea. I just no guardrail? Used, no guardrail. And I just used my intuition to say, like, all right, this looks like a good spot to stop. And so I, I avoided that. But why it was beautiful, during that time, there was like maybe four hours of sunlight. You got to wake up real early. Mm-hmm. The skies were like pastel pinks, almost greens and blues. It was out of a painting. It looked like Monet just scattered across the sky. There was nobody out there. So you go to the waterfalls, you go to these black sand beaches. The level of tourism is, is very low. And so it's just you and nature. You go out, it's just this quiet wind, a little bit of the particles of, of snow just casting past the road. That's so- and you know you want to talk about serene and you know you could listen to all the the calm videos and music that you would enjoy but nothing comes as close to the the calm tranquility as just being you in that atmosphere and it is just you take it with you forever that's why some people are like it's heaven on earth i would go back in an instant because you know, sometimes we were talking about before where sometimes the memory of something becomes something either greater or worse than what it really was. But I truly believe the memory of this, not only was it fantastic and, and out of this world, but I have a strong feeling the experience is experience better. Is even better. Yeah. Wow. So when you go, do you go on these trips as like almost like a regenerative, like, let me just be by myself and just recharge? Yeah. Or do you, do you, now do you stay by yourself for the majority of the trip or do you try to meet people kind of like mingle with the locals, try to make new friends kind of thing? 99% of my trips are always like work related. So I'm on and then after whatever is done, I'll, I'll go in on the town. But for this specific trip, I went on my own. I had a free moment and this was a recharge trip. Mm. So go see the nature, take some photos, you know, get some watch images. Sure. But it was a, a personal recharge. That's great. So I think everybody should do that. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. 
So I think we're we're out of time. Yeah. But yeah, this was uh, this was fun. I enjoyed it. I I would say if you're watching this, um, leave us a comment. Uh, let us know what questions you'd like us to ask or or what questions you have um, so that we can answer them on the show make sure you subscribe follow like whatever it may be that you're seeing this on i'm just totally <laughs> messing this up oh it's good <laughs> i think after we say this a few more times it'll come naturally yeah yeah subscribe and and uh hit the bell so you don't miss the next one and buy more brew watches buy more buy all of them just complete your collection you know you, you, know you want to do it <laughs>